Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, um, Audrey and Sashang for uh, and all the other helpers for making this happen. This is really uh, amazing. Um, we started Go probably close to 10 years ago, in 2007, end of 2007, and uh, it's, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that nobody at that time and uh, in the Go team thought that we would ever get to this place where we are right now. So thank you very, very much for all of you and you know, for in, your enthusiasm into, in Go. That's really great. So this is a talk about Go the language. Uh, a lot of, had, lot of um, things have been said about the language. Um, many aspects of the language have been covered. And I'm going to dive into a little bit the aspect of packages, a little bit more in detail than has been maybe done in the past. <clears throat> so Go packages is the main mechanism uh, the, uh, for programming in the large that Go provides. And they, they make it possible to divvy up a large project into smaller pieces. A Go package provides a namespace for encapsulation and uh, information hiding. And it also provides an interface against which you can program. And there is an import mechanism that allows you to uh, depend on a package. On the implementation side, there are two main pieces of machinery that make packages work. One is the linker, which I'm not going to talk about, and the other one is the export and import mechanism, which are uh, more complicated than it may seem at first. <clears throat> so in this talk, I'm going to go concentrate on the export and the uh, import. But before we do, let's step back in time a little bit uh, into a simpler time. And that time is the 1970s, and uh, the simpler language is C. So incidentally, we have Dennis Ritchie here, the inventor of C, and Ken Thompson, the inventor of Unix, uh, doing something on a PDP-11. According to Ken, they don't know what they were doing at this point uh, on this machine. Um, but the, the language of choice at that point, or the, the new upcoming language, was C. So imagine you were in this, uh, you were living in that time and you just managed to write your first Hello World program and you were able to call a function um, and write a function. And so your next step is to write a little bit larger program. And that, that program is something that does a little bit of math. Because at that time, computers, they have no graphical displays, they have no mice unless you were lucky and worked at Xerox Park. And there were, computers were mostly there for math. So you're going to uh, write a program that does prime number factorization. Sorry, number factorization into primes. And that program is going to produce some output like this. So if you had Go at that time, you might have written something like this. A simple standalone program, a small main function that basically factorizes the first thousand numbers and you might have, might have written a factor function and a print function. And you went a little bit overboard, you actually separated the printing from the factorization. And uh, in order to communicate the prime factors from the factorization function to the print function, you introduced a linked list, which is, um, which you can see here where the elements of the linked list, the, the fields of the linked list are the factors, the, the power, how many times a factor appears, and then the link to the next element. But there's no go for another 40 years or so. So you end up writing it in C. And your program looks almost the same as the Go program, except that the includes, they are now, sorry, the imports are now becoming includes. Uh, the type declarations are inside out. And there is an awful lot of semicolons, which looks like the most normal thing in the world to you. So in other words, your program is a closed box, and all those gophers are neatly packed up inside it. So your prime factorizer is so fabulous um, that other people want to use it too. So you decide to create a library. And so you're going to factor out, so to speak, the factor function, the print function, and the list type into a separate packet. Or in other words, you're going to split up those gophers just so. So once you have created that library, of course you need to now connect to that library. And in 
in C, of course, the correct or the usual standard way of doing this is to use a header file, but as you may know, you can also uh, not use a header file. You can just do declare that library interface explicitly in your client. So in your main.c that we have now here, you would redeclare the struct type that you're using. You would external declare factor and print as externally de uh, defined functions without function bodies, and the rest of your program looks the same. And so the C compiler can now compile this main.c as long as there are no syntactic errors, uh, and uh, otherwise it's correct, it will compile this file completely separately of the library, in fact, independently, and you will get a main.o. Main and equivalently, you can do the same thing on the library side. If your lib.c has no errors, uh, semantically correct, it will compile and you get a lib.o. And it's now the linker's job to connect those two uh, pieces of object files. And the linker actually doesn't care about the interfaces at all. The linker only cares about symbols. As long as there is a reference to a blue, purple, and pink gopher in your main.o, and as long as your lib.o has a blue, uh, purple, and pink gopher symbol, it will connect the two, and everything is uh, jolly, and your program hopefully works. Um, in fact, it will even do that, the linker, that is, if you made mistakes. So if you declared your list type without any fields, the, the blind gopher, or if you had uh, your factor and print function with the wrong signatures, the disheveled and drowning gopher here, then it would still link. And if you're lucky, your program crashes. And if you're not so lucky, your program works and there's a subtle error somewhere that you won't notice for a long time. So the better solution is, of course, to use a header file and use includes to get the same effect. And so from the C compiler's perspective, there's absolutely no difference between the prior solution and this solution because the C compiler proper actually never sees the include. That is all done by the preprocessor, which uh, removes the includes, which basically actually includes that text. And so from the C, sorry, from the C compiler's point of view, the sources look exactly the same as before. But even if you use a header file, you don't actually get proper enforced information hiding because, like before, we could still declare the shape of the gopher hand and feet in main.c, and then, and even though they're never intended to be visible to the outside, and then our main program could you know, wiggle the toes and the fingers of that blue gopher even though header file never exposed those things. So header files work surprisingly well, but there's of course a lot of issues. Um, there's a lot of boilerplate that you have to write all the time to really make it work. You have to use include guards and so forth, which I haven't talked here much. There is a duplication. You need to repeat signatures of functions, both in the header file and in the implementation. They, there is information leakage. You cannot prevent certain things to be exposed, even though you don't want to expose them. For instance, in C, if you have a struct type where there's fields that you don't want to expose, you still have to mention them to get the correct size of the struct. In C++, it's a bit better there. You have a private uh, attribute, but, but in C, you can't. And furthermore, header files tend to include other header files. So the amount of text that needs to be processed by the preprocessor is significant, and in a very large system it can be huge. And there is anecdotal evidence that uh, at Google, uh, one header file was included you know, many, many tens of thousands of times, because it was just a header file that was used everywhere. <clears throat> now the include cards will of course prevent the compiler from seeing the details, but you, the preprocessor still has to actually process that file or those files. So what we really want is a dedicated language feature to uh, construct libraries. Uh, we don't want to have boilerplate. We don't want to write includes, which are really kind of like a poor man's uh, mechanism for creating libraries. We don't want redundancy. We don't want to repeat, for instance, function signatures and we have to write them twice and make sure that they, they match. 
We want proper information hiding, and we want an efficient implementation because at scale, it affects compilation speed. And we want it to be self-contained. In, in C, with header files, you have to refer to other header files, which in turn may refer to other header files and so forth. Uh, you, we don't want to have that. We, we want to have all the information that is needed for one particular interface of a, of a library uh, in one place. So it didn't take very long for the programming language community at that time to come up with better solutions. And here is a, uh, a number of languages that pioneered the notion of modules or packages, if you will. And some of these languages, such as Modula 2 and Ada, they had the notion of both an implementation and a definition package, where the definition package was a separate file, if you will, that described just the interface. That's actually not very far from header files, except that when you were compiling those, the compiler made sure that those definition files matched exactly with the implementation. And compiling those would produce another file, which is sort of similar to what a pre-compiled header file in C would be. Oberon is a direct successor of Modula 2, and it was probably one of the first languages that did away with the separation of definition and implementation. So you could just, in the implementation, specify with a special marker, I want this to be exported. And as some of you may know, Oberon is a, a, um, a prime influencer in the design of Go. In fact, uh, the package mechanism in Go and the import-export are very, very closely um, matched with, with what o Oberon did. So interestingly, one language actually bucked that trend at that time for backward compatibility. And at some point, they introduced namespaces, which helped, but um, it lasted for a very long time. I think the latest version of C++ now finally also has modules. So at some point, everybody comes around, I guess. So they, today, a language that takes itself serious and that's intended for large-scale programming simply needs to have some support for modularization. And there is now all modern languages, whether statically typed or dynamically typed, have some form of mechanism for that. There's different implementations, and the concepts are maybe not completely the same, but overall, the idea is the same. So now we are ready to dive into the details of Go's implementation of import and export. What does the compiler actually need to make this happen? It needs to have the details of the package that it that you compile against, uh, if you import something, it needs a representation of that API in a form that the compiler can understand, which is usually some form of a graph. And in order to communicate that graph from the package that you compiled to the, cabbage, the package that you're going to compile and that imports the other package, you need to have a form of serialization of that graph. So this graph looks a little bit like a syntax tree, but it's not really a syntax tree because it may uh, contain cycles. Uh, it may be a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So there's more stuff in there than just what you would see in a syntax tree. So let's look at what happens when we compile a Go package. On the very left, we have this, our library again. Let's assume that it doesn't import anything. So when you compile this explicitly, it produces a lib.o. And in Go, the information about that interface is actually in lib.o itself. Now, if we want to compile our client, the compiler doesn't just look at the source code of client.go. It also, because it contains an import of our package lib, it will also need to consult that export data. And it does that by looking up lib.o, or if the package was installed, your lib.a, and opening that up and, try and finding the export data in that file. And then use that to completely compile your client.go. And then as a result, it produces its own client.o, which in turn, again, may have export data on it, uh, of its own. So, let me just ask first, who of you has ever opened a .o file with a text editor? 
Okay, very, very few, like three or so. So I, you know, do it sometime, it's interesting. So in fact, if you use a pre 1.7 compiler and you did exactly that, you would see something like this. So most of the object file, of course, is gibberish. You can't really read it. But the beginning is actually clear text. And it looks like what you can see between the dollar brackets here as if this were like some kind of an interface description. In fact, if you squint your eyes just so, it almost looks like a C header file. So did Ken Thompson actually hide a glorified header file basically in plain sight in a .o file? Sure he did. And it's actually not surprising because it made a lot of sense at that time. Remember, this is a compiler that originally was a C compiler, so why not reuse as much machinery as there was uh, present at the time? And secondly, the header file contains a lot of the information that you need, except that we need a little bit more. And, and you can see that there's a lot of stuff in there that doesn't quite make sense. So a huge advantage of this format is, of course, that you can parse it easily uh, by, uh, with human eyes. Uh, but it's not really Go code. There's a lot of redundancy in this information. Let me go back here again. Uh, you can see that, for instance, be because, it's, because it's human readable and because it tries to be Go code, it follows a certain syntax. And so things like keywords are there, certain strings are repeated, etc., etc. Compiler really doesn't need this. In fact, even though it looks like Go code, it's pretty far removed from actual Go code. And in C, where you can use the same parser to parse your pre-compiled, sorry, your, your header file, in Go you can actually not use the same parser to parse these export data, uh, this export data. In fact, it turned out to be a completely duplicated separate parser that just was a little bit different. So all this led to much more complicated processing than was really necessary and made the export data more longer and made the processing of imports and producing of export data slower. So address, to address this issue, we switched to a binary export format with 1.7. And this is now what this format looks like now. And it's completely unreadable, of course. You can still identify a few strings here and there. And it's, in fact, quite a bit shorter doesn't maybe look like that because, because uh, the control characters here always show up as two characters, so it seems a bit longer than, or almost the same as the textual format, but it's not. Furthermore, this format actually also contains additional information such as line number information, uh, file, number informa file information that was not present in the original format, and it would be quite difficult to add that to the original format. It would make it even more verbose. So the binary export format has the advantage of not being restricted by the concrete syntax. So we can easily change it and add additional stuff. There's no need for a lexer or a full-fledged parser to process it. We can make this representation as compact as we can possibly uh, come up with. The format can also be easily extended because whenever we want to export more information, right? We can just write it in there. We are not constrained by any uh, problems that the syntax might pose. But we also lose the readability. But that doesn't matter because the only person that's really concerned about readability is the compiler writer. So everybody else will benefit. So how did we get here? So to, to understand how the export data is generated, we need to look a little bit at the internal data structure of, uh, of a, a compilation. So the internal representation of this package that we looked at in the beginning is a, is a graph. And we can see here that our package, our library package contains three entities that we're going to export, the list type, the factor type, factor function, and the print function. And in turn, all of them have a type. I'm just going to look at the list type here. It's a named type. And the named type has an underlying type, which is a struct which in turn has three fields, factor, power, and link. And those again, of course, have types. And in particular, the last field, link, 
as a pointer type that points back to itself. So here we have a cycle in our data structure. This is also a cycle that you find in the Go source code because we create them through names. But in our internal representation, there is additional cycles. For instance, the compiler needs to know for each entity, entity type, function, constant, whatever you have, which package it came from. So all those entities actually have pointers back to the corresponding package object. You can see that with the list type here on the, on the left. So there's more than that. There's, there's cycles uh, that are not necessarily visible in the source code, and we have to deal with them. So since the internal representation of our package is a graph, if we want to communicate that graph from one compilation to the next, we have to serialize that graph. So exporting a package interface means serializing that package interface's graph. And that's, of course, a very uh, old problem. It's well known. And the solution is fairly straightforward. You recursively traverse the, this graph, and then you write out the nodes as they show up in the order of traversal. But you have to make sure that if you've seen the no, a node before, that you don't go and, re, and write that node out again. Because otherwise, if you have a, a DAG, you might duplicate nodes, and if you have a cycle, you end up in an endless recursion. By the way, if you ever wondered if DAGs exist in nature, uh, apparently they do, as my son proved to me. <laughs> so I'm going to write down this serialization algorithm in Go here. And the reason why I do this is it's the core of the import and the export. And it is so easy that it can be written down literally in 10 lines of code. So whenever you are in a situation now in the future that you need to serialize some arbitrary graph data structure, there's no need to look for kind of a library or a framework or whatever. It's literally 10 lines of code in Go. So the idea here is that you have this write note function. And of course, as, as we've discussed before, whenever you write a note, you first have to figure out, did we write out this note before? So there's this check here where we see if the node n is in a map that I called seen before. And if it is, then we've written out that node. And so in order to serialize that node, we now write out simply a small integer value greater or equal zero, a positive integer value. And that's our, that's our indication that this is a node that we already written out. And that integer value is, if you will, the number of that node. And we're done. If this node has not been written out before, then we, of course, have to write it out. But before we do that, we remember that we've seen this node, so we add it to the map, and we give it the next available index, which happens to be the length of the map at that time. And then we write out another integer, which now is a negative value, and we choose this negative value such that it identifies what kind of node we have. So remember our uh, slide, a couple of slides before, we have different kinds of nodes, nodes that identify packages, types, functions, and so forth. So your integer that you're writing, going to write out here is going to be a value that indicates one of those nodes. And then after that, you write the contents of your node, whatever that node contains, which in, point, in, in turn may contain links, and thus this may call write node recursively. So the key insight here is to keep in mind that every node that's being serialized starts with an integer. And that was my talk. <laughs> okay. Uh, now that we understand how the serialization works, we can look at the deserialization. So because each node is serialized starting with an integer first, the first thing we need to do is we need to read that int back in. And so if that int is a positive value, then we know we've seen this node before, uh, and so it must be, we must have read it before, and in fact, we can just look it up in our table. The seen before map is now a seen before list, and the only thing we need to do is we just index in that, into that list and we get the node. If the value that we read in is a negative number, then we have not seen this node before, and so we create the appropriate node and we use the value of that integer to, to create the right kind of node. And then we add it to our list. And we have to do this 
before we do anything else because we may refer to this node while constructing this node. And then we read the contents, which again may call read node recursively. And that's it. So let's look at some results. So this is our library export data in textual format on the right. And on the left, we see the entities that we need to write out. In the middle is the data that we need to encode. So this textual format didn't use this serialization algorithm. It used a different uh, mechanism. But I'm not going to go into the details here. The important as aspect here is that to just export the list type, we needed about 72 bytes, assuming that each, each empty uh, each white space between words is counted as one blank. Now, if we look at exactly the same with the binary export format, it looks quite a bit different. So our encoding on the left shows these tags, which are negative numbers, which indicate the kind of note that we're going to write out. And then there is strings that are being written out as their respective bytes. Uh, and we see at the end of the lines, we see positive integers, which are indices of objects that we, have written, that we have already written out. For instance, on the second to last line, on the very right bottom, you see the number 30. That is a reference for the list type that we've already written out. And the reason why it's got the index 30 is because the previous indices were reserved for the pre-declared types in Go. So, all these types already have numbers from 0 to uh, 29. So this only used 38 bytes to get the same amount of information encoded, which is about 50% of the text version. This is not as good as we would have hoped, but this is only a small piece of code here. As soon as your export becomes larger, there's much more reuse going on, and so it compresses much better. And in fact, the savings turned out to be much bigger. When we first introduced the binary export data format, we reduced the original export format data size by 20, by, to 29% from the original. This is not quite an apples to apples comparison because some things were still missing at the time. For instance, exported inline function bodies were not there. They're now present. Also, we now encode position information, which was not there which is now present. So we're probably quite a bit higher again, but still we got the benefit of a much faster algorithm. In fact, it had quite a bit of an impact on large, um, large systems. And so here's a quote from Dave Cheney from that time where he observed the significant speed up of the compiler simply because import processing became so much quicker. So the problem is unfortunately not solved. Even though import and export is now very fast, it's much easier in the compiler to implement and much easier to change. If we have very, very large exports, then we still spend a significant amount of time in that, uh, in that part of the compiler. For instance, if you have a project where you have data structures that are very large, and I'm thinking here of protocol buffers, which can be huge, and you export the types for those protocol buffers, then the whole type shows up in this export data. But if you now import that, that package and you only need two fields of that type, you still need to process the entire export data to get to those two fields. And that's a huge waste of processing. So we're going to look into this and try to see what we, we can do. There's, there's probably different approaches we can take, but one that seems promising is to re-engineer the export data one more time, such that it is indexable and so that we can do indexed access. So the compiler will not have to process export data at all until it needs it, and when it needs it, it only needs to decode the parts that it really needs. So I'd like to conclude with a couple of final observations. So at this point, support for modularization, modularization has pretty much passed the test of time in, in programming languages. It's been around for 40 years. It's a well-established uh, programming paradigm, and every programming language needs to support it. 
But at the same time, a proper package implementation in a compiler is not a trivial task. There's quite a bit of engineering, there's a lot of machinery to make this happen well. And other languages have tried to work around this with sort of poor man solution. I'm thinking about includes here. But if the abstraction is right, and in this case, I think the abstraction is right for this paradigm, it is really worthwhile doing the work and paying the price for it. And I think this is not just true for this programming language, language concept, it's also true for, for any kind of engineering effort. Thank you very much.